Good afternoon. Uh, for those who uh, did not grow up with the TV series Star Trek, uh, I may reveal that this is part of an entry sequence quote, uh, quote uh, and it continues, um, to explore st strange new worlds, to seek new life and new civilizations, and to boldly go where no one has gone before. And that really spells space science to me. It's really exploratory science in many different ways. For the theorists, uh, we still don't have a good theory describing the plasma physics in the universe and in, in the uh, space around us. For the uh, technology part, it's really challenging. It's um, something that where you only get one try, you don't go and fix your instrument once it's launched to space. And increasingly, it's also business. Uh, there are uh, assets worth billions of euros that we need to protect against the very hazardous uh, environment around the Earth. And for the artistic type, space is also the beautiful oral displays and I'll hope to come back to uh, at the end of what that tells us about other worlds that where we have not gone yet. So Ilkka Niemela has been asking new professors why Aalto, and clearly it's a place, space, for me the answer is obvious because space is the place where science and art meet technology and business. So that's my five cents worth of advertisement of the university. One of my early tasks uh, as a young uh, PhD was to develop a new um, old sky camera system monitoring the auroras in Finland. And so one of my uh, first graduate students and, and uh, or undergraduate students, then graduate student and then postdoc uh, developed a new digital camera and deployed uh, eight of these cameras that at present record uh, auroras all the time when it's dark, sufficiently dark and uh, throughout the year. So we take roughly uh, three to four uh, million imi auroral images per year at, at the rate of uh, three uh, per minute. And so here you can see uh, uh, a sequence of images running, uh, taken uh, with a camera at the Kevo station and, and as you can see, you cannot see auroras in daylight, so it needs to be dark. <laughs> so auroras actually tell us a lot about, uh, not only about uh, things that happen in the other ap upper atmosphere, but also what happens in the um, near-Earth space. Auroras are created by particles that flow uh, from uh, space into the atmosphere. And when I was working as a um, postdoc uh, in, uh, in the US in Boulder, I got to work with the polar satellite that views the entire view of the auroras, not limited to uh, a sp spatial location, but really seeing the whole auroral oval that encircles the uh, polar regions, both the northern polar region as shown here, but also the southern polar region. These are ring-like, uh, uh, ring-like uh, bright features that are permanently there and they wax and wane depending on how uh, particle fluxes from the sun actually impact on the earth. And if I get these to run once more, I'll, I'll just highlight here. Uh, here is shown how the mag magnetic field lines, uh, which are these yellow threads here, Actually, uh, the particles that create the auroras come along these magnetic field lines and they come from large distances, uh, originally from the sun, then come back to, to the near-Earth space. And with uh, satellites, we can monitor these uh, particles and the associated electromagnetic fields in space. And so, uh, the auroras that we see are really a lit up TV screen uh, created actually by similar processes as, as your old fashioned tube TV. 
And uh, so monitoring auroras tells you a lot what happens, what are the particle fluxes that are uh, eminent in, in the near Earth space and beyond. So uh, finally, uh, or gradually, we built up this picture how uh, the, the particles leave the sun in big bubbles that, that uh, weigh several tons. They come to the near Earth region in a couple of days as they travel through the space. And uh, then the magnetic field of the Earth that's uh, depicted here with this blue uh, sh basically shields us from, from most of this radiation. But some of these particles get in, they disturb the magnetic fields and shoot particles that then are guided uh, along these magnetic field lines and then they focus around the ovals of the auroras and, and uh, bright, uh, light up these auroras. And these are the, the types of processes that we study. We understand the big picture, but a lot of the details are still in the open. If you think of uh, that um, as an experimentalist, if you think of the uh, challenges that we're facing, we uh, have few satellites uh, in the very best cases, we have several satellites in space that spans uh, hundreds of millions of kilometers. We cannot um, say set the, the places where the, the satellites are because they are in orbits that they orbit around the Earth on their own uh, Keplerian orbits. We cannot uh, control the sun shooting these particles into space. So we can't decide what we measure where we measure and when we measure. We just measure at whatever location we happen to be, whatever happens to come to us. So uh, experimentally, this is a very challenging field and we still lack, uh, therefore, uh, understanding of many of the even basic processes that, that uh, run these dynamic phenomena in near Earth space. And that's why modeling has uh, turned out to be a very important tool in space science. And what we did uh, here uh, at, when I was at the Finnish Meteorological Institute, we developed a big uh, simulation code that basically uh, uh, describes the entire near-Earth uh, space region and also the uh, topside atmosphere or the ionosphere where the auroras reside. And so here's a picture, an animation of the auroral evolution that comes in the simulation. And here's the uh, magnetic boundary, the, the bubble inside, magnetic bubble inside which the Earth is, is somewhere inside this bubble. And what's color coded here is the energy that enters from the solar wind, from the sun, from the solar particles into the near Earth space. And as you can see, this is highly time variable uh, as uh, the particle fluxes change, the energy input into the system changes radically. And if we're talking about energy, um, most of the energy that we usually talk here on Earth uh, originates from solar radiation energy, which is roughly uh, 1.3 kilowatts at Earth orbit. The atmosphere takes uh, out part of that, so we get roughly one kilow kilowatt of energy um, per square meter uh, on the surface of the Earth. Well, solar storms, they are a variable source, by, but there's quite a bit of more energy. There's 10 to the 6 million megawatts enters the near-Earth space roughly uh, at all times at a variable rate. And roughly 100 megawatts enters the upper atmosphere at the 100 kilometer altitude where the auroras reside. So if we only had a 100 kilometer long plug and, and could tap onto the energy of the auroras, we would have no problems in, in uh, energy resources anymore. We have, uh, these codes are actually numerically very demanding. We're uh, utilizing the Alto uh, supercomputing capabilities and getting this installed now here here as well, and uh, this is the only uh, such code in, in Europe. There are about uh, five co such codes worldwide that, that are capable of treating the entire near-Earth space region. 
And what our specialty has really been is that rather than looking at qualitative pictures, we have really gone into quantitative analysis of these simulation results, which again is, is quite a challenge because of the amount of gigabytes that, that uh, these uh, computations produce and, and the quantitative analysis of these results is, an, is another challenge in itself. But as I already alluded to, uh, this is uh, also a question of practical importance. We were early on involved in uh, setting up the uh, European Space Agency uh, Space Weather Program that monitors the near-Earth uh, environment and tries to estimate what kinds of particle fluxes there are that might be hazardous to the satellites that, that uh, surround the Earth. And, and so uh, this has then developed into a program that uh, is called Space Situational Awareness that also not only looks at the uh, particle fluxes around the Earth, but also looks at the increasing amount of both man-made and natural space debris around the Earth. That's also very dangerous due to uh, satellites as well as uh, if we put humans in space and then meteors and, and their possible impacts with the planet. And when I was look, uh, working at the Los Alamos National Laboratory, we worked on a very complex set of models that really looked at the radiation environment that surrounds the Earth and uh, what kind of effects that has on the satellites. And again, here you can see the high variability that, that uh, occurs in these radiation belts as time goes onward. But while I have been uh, fiddling in the near-Earth space, some of my colleagues at the uh, uh, Finnish Meteorological Institute were busy, actually the same guy who uh, built the old sky camera system, we're busy building a, uh, an atmospheric sensor to a probe that was sent to land on uh, Saturn's largest moon, Titan. Titan is an interesting place. It's, it's a little bit smaller than Earth, but uh, so it's planetary size, uh, and it has a nitrogen-based atmosphere like our own. So even though it's very far away from the Earth, it's actually the most Earth-like object in the solar system that we have. But here you can see that uh, uh, space uh, business is, is really for the patient. Uh, the project started in 1987. Ten years of building of the instruments and the spacecraft, it was launched in 97. It arrived at uh, Saturn orbit in 2004. And in the following year, it landed on the moon of Titan. So after 17 years worth of effort, we got four hours of measurements as we landed through the atmosphere of Titan. Let me say that those were a nervous four hours. And, uh, but as a result of, uh, of those four hours, we did get uh, our pressure sensor uh, work perfectly and we got, uh, as we landed through the atmosphere, we got the uh, measurements of the increasing pressure and uh, the pressure of the, uh, at the impact is actually very close to that of the Earth. So, so not only is the atmospheric composition, but also the uh, surface pressure very much is uh, very similar to that of the Earth. But uh, more excitingly, there was also a camera, and now you're seeing pictures of the landing starting at about 30 kilometers uh, when you get below the clouds. Um, and this is a landing of uh, where I, it's the furthest place uh, from Earth that man-made man object has ever landed. And you can see the, uh, see the uh, mountains there. You can also see uh, river, river banks, which uh, indicate that there has been liquid fluids. And you can also see that um, it's, uh, so, so there has been some volcanic activity and liquid fluids. And of course, these are the kinds of elements that we always look when we look for signs of uh, life that, that might exist or have existed in, in the uh, surroundings. It actually has a, uh, Titan has a liquid surface. It's uh, not water, it's methane. 
and, and therefore in liquid form in that very cold environment. And soon you can see the parachute shadow going around us as it impacts. There goes the shadow of the parachute as the satellite uh, hits, hits the ground. And soon after that, we lost the signal. But that was, uh, that I think is uh, space exploration at its best. If you look backward from the sun, this is what it roughly looks like. This is the sun. It's uh, about as bright as a uh, full moon here at Earth, but also, of course, considerably smaller. And you can see uh, other planets as bright spots. But of course, we've been further out still. Uh, you have probably read in the press that the 37-year journey uh, of Voyager 1 has finally left out from the uh, solar system or for, for, uh, from the heliosphere, from the uh, space environment governed by the solar, solar output in plasma. And what does that have to do with us? Actually, quite a lot. We are here at Alta, we are building, our students are building a small satellite. It's a CubeSat. It's 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by 30 centimeters in size. So it's a miniature one, but it's a full-fledged satellite uh, with uh, three scientific instruments, one of which is a technology demonstration of a propulsion method that would allow, um, if successful, it would allow us to, without fuel, go at a continuously accelerating pace into the outer solar system. And that would mean that instead of taking 37 years to get out of the solar system, it might only get, um, take 10 years uh, to get out of the solar system. And we could reach Saturn in just a couple of years, which is nothing con considering the timescales that we talk about here. But meanwhile, uh, when we still haven't uh, done that, we, we can search for life uh, remotely, and fortunately, there are also lots of other planets around. Uh, these are the recent statistics of a, um, a mission that, that uh, detects planets around other stars, and as you can see, uh, first, in the, in the first place, we were only able to see these Jupiter-sized, very large gas giants where it's not likely that you would find any Earth-like Earth life. But now with uh, in increasingly better instrumentation, we have found uh, several hundred uh, in the Earth size and, and uh, about 2,000 that are in the same, same range, same size range as the Earth. And what would you look for um, habitable? You know, now we know that there are lots of planets. Do we know that they're habitable? What would you look for to tell? You can't see whether they have buildings or, or, or people. You can't see that far. But actually, auroras are quite a nice way. There are two different factors that make auroras a uh, very uh, uh, good detector of human life. In, or, or life in, in itself. One is if you have auroras, uh, you know that there is a magnetic field surrounding the planet, and hence you have a shield against the solar radiation. And the auroral light is generated by uh, the is, is, uh, particles from space colliding with an atmosphere, so you know that the planet has an atmosphere. Again, another constitution, uh, another important uh, element in, in uh, creating a water cycle or, or shielding from atmospheric, ra uh, from space radiation and lots of other things. So uh, for the uh, next time when you look for the auroras, you can also think that these are the signal that, that really tells that, that we are here, just look for us and uh, they are only waiting to hear from us. Thank you.